Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your husband's conscious effort so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about what is cheating in a relationship. And to say that my guest Brenda was disillusioned about marriage is an understatement. She was resentful about always having to be the responsible one and questioning if she'd made a good decision to marry her husband in the first place. But then she tried an experiment and was amazed that the results led to immediate closeness and connection and the realization that she has a good man. Today, she says she has the true partnership she always wanted. She's going to tell us what she did, so you can do it too. The Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award goes to some familiar tripe that's meant to help a woman who's anguished about her husband not coming to bed at the same time as her, but it's terrible. All of that's coming up, but first let's talk about what is cheating in a relationship? If you're asking yourself the question, what is cheating in a relationship? That means you're already between a rock and a hard place trying to figure out what to do. Like what if he's sending inappropriate flirty messages to his ex from high school, but you know, he hasn't seen her in person or he's texting a female colleague all the time and won't show you his phone, but says nothing's going on. Or what if you overhear him saying he has feelings for someone else, or you find out He's got an online dating profile. It sure feels icky to know he's having intimate conversations with a woman who isn't you. That's not the marriage you signed up for. You don't want to be a fool just hoping it hasn't gone too far. And you don't also want to be a jealous, possessive monster for thinking it's way over the line either. Mostly it's terrifying because it could mean that something very bad is about to happen His behavior is a threat to your family and your finances and your status. It's also a threat to your happiness and a knife to your heart. It could mean that the promises you've built your life on are not so solid after all. If he really is cheating, we've all heard it thousands of times that you shouldn't put up with it because then he'll think it's okay and take advantage. But if you divorce, you're going to break your kids' hearts as well as your own. So of course you want him to stop before he crosses the line, which brings up some very tough questions like, how should you react? Does this mean that your husband isn't being faithful? Does it mean he's going to leave you? Can you even repair things from here? Or is your marriage doomed to be another divorce statistic because of his bad decisions? Should you give him an ultimatum that you'll divorce unless he stops? Or should you try to be understanding, but insist on marriage counseling? Well, here are three expert approved actions you can take to put things right in your marriage when you're not sure if your husband is cheating, but he's not exactly being faithful either. Number one, yell, scream, and cry, but not at him. Whether or not your husband is cheating, there's something happening in your marriage that's shocking and very hurtful. And as a human, You're going to have feelings about that. And it's totally appropriate to have those feelings and let them have their day in the sun. However, consider having them in front of a trusted confidant or a coach instead of your husband. Let it all out so it can arise and naturally subside as all feelings do. It really is sad and scary and hard. It's so normal to need to express that. Of course, you may be tempted to punish him, or maybe you already have raged at him for what he's doing. It's totally understandable. That's just human. As a mere mortal woman, you naturally want him to hurt too. But since you're on the same team, it's not possible to punish him without punishing yourself too. And I don't want that for you. I don't want you having more punishment. You need tender love and care, not the emotional hangover that inevitably follows when you rage. Relieve some of the pressure by getting yourself a big, empathetic listening ear so you can delay any mutual destruction with your husband until you feel better. And you will feel better in the future. And the better you feel, the better decisions you can make for yourself and your future. Which brings me to the second action that you can take. Number two, crystallize your vision. 
when you got married, you had a vision for a bright, happy future with your husband. What was your vision? Maybe you haven't thought about it for a while. Maybe it doesn't seem relevant right now, or it feels too painful to revisit. But I invite you to think about what your vision for your future marriage is right now. Why? Because we are all always creating our future according to what we're focusing on. You're standing at a crossroads. You know, if you're wondering if your husband is cheating, well, that's a kind of a crossroads. Your future is hanging in the balance with so many strong feelings inside of you. This is a critical time to visit your future self from a year from now, say, and have her tell you how everything went your way. Everything. Have her explain how after that breakdown, there was a breakthrough. Pay no attention to the naysaying voices in your head telling you that your vision is unrealistic or it's impossible. That's the illusion and it's meant to be convincing, but it's not that relevant. You're a powerful manifester yourself who can create the future you want to have. But what is that future for you? Is it dancing at your 50th wedding anniversary surrounded by your kids and grandkids? I like to think about my vision for my life almost every day and fill in big and small details as I go. I never get tired of looking around and realizing I'm living in a way that I once only daydreamed about. Number three, suffocate the other woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not literally. I don't mean that. I mean, deprive her of the oxygen of your attention by focusing on something else that isn't her. Ideally, your own happiness is what you'd be focused on. And it may seem like being vigilant and knowing what's going on with him and whoever he's texting, that's going to keep you safe. But that's also an illusion. We call that shopping for pain. Safety and security come from paying attention to myself and my experience and not from knowing every detail of who my husband is talking to and how often and what he's saying. That's a counterfeit. It's a distraction from your real needs and desires, which are likely going unmet during this current breakdown. What do you need today? To watch a comedy and have a good laugh? or time with your sister and your friend, or a bike ride in nature, or a nap, or some window shopping and a chocolate dessert, maybe a change of scenery and a great movie. If you're wondering how any of that's going to help fix your marriage problems, that's what I wondered too. How will watching cat videos and playing volleyball ever change that my husband isn't paying attention to me and won't make love to me? But getting quiet enough to listen to and honor those nudges from my heart about what I desired, that was a powerful way to get back to being myself. The woman my husband fell in love with and wanted to delight and adore forever and ever. And when I found her again, that's what I experienced from him again. And that's what I was really wanting all along. Now that I've had the honor of witnessing so many other women do the same thing to repair their marriages when there was a sinking feeling about him cheating, I'm convinced that there's no better way to start to make your marriage last and thrive. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. To say my guest Brenda was disillusioned with marriage is an understatement. She was resentful about always having to be the responsible one and questioning if she'd made a good decision to marry her husband in the first place. But then she tried an experiment and was amazed that the results led to immediate closeness, connection, and the realization that she has a good man. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. 
Brenda, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. All right. I want to hear about the bad old days. What was going on? Okay. Um, well, the bad old days in my marriage were interspersed throughout a lot of good days. Um, but they had their inception before we even got married. Um, I was pretty pragmatic about the whole thing. I wanted to get married. I didn't want to start over with anyone else. And my husband loved me or my future husband loved me. So like what could go wrong? Right. (laughs) Um, so I, I moved forward and, um, I had a lot of evidence to keep going through with our engagement, but I also had a lot of moments where I just struggled with doubt and concerns would come up. Um, he was younger than me was just one of them, but there was just a lot of little things that would come up and I would just kind of get stuck in this place where it would just overtake me. I started having anxiety, which I had never had before. Um, but then I would talk to my future husband and he was like, so, you know, no pressure and, um, just really patient, which made me think like, no, this is a great guy. Like, this is what I want to do. I want to get married. Um, so I would go forward, but that pattern of kind of going to that dark place where I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure I was making the right decision and all the negative things would just come up. But I thought getting married would kind of resolve a lot of them, you know, maybe it's just nerves, you know, whatever. Um, but I was wrong. (laughs) And those moments of like, what did I do? And, or what am I doing would come up and I would focus on all the things that, that weren't quite right or weren't what I expected to happen in a marriage. Um, and it started pretty early with little things, you know, like he would, Um, we'd just been married a really short time and he'd want to go hang out with a friend or he'd be on his computer. And I, I just thought like, I'm married now. Like I have my person. I don't need anyone else. This is great. Um, so when he did, you know, normal things like that, I, I kind of like, it was evidence for me that he didn't really understand what marriage was or what it meant to be a husband. And so then again, I would go to that dark place where I just started questioning, like, what did I do? Um, and it would get really bad, like just um, maybe like we had been married less than a month when I was feeling that way about some little thing. And the idea of an annulment popped into my head. I had never even thought I never even thought about that word, I don't think. And it came into my mind and was like, you could get an annulment and it would be like this never happened. And it shocked me. And I was like, where is that coming from? And what does it mean? And is that the answer? Um but I didn't really want to get an annulment. I didn't want to get divorced. I loved my husband. Um, but I also felt really trapped because this just kept happening, just kept happening where I would go to that place. And I had no way to explain it to him. Um, I didn't know how I would just stay inside and it would just boil inside of me. Um, and yeah, that, that was like kind of the start of it. And Did you say it was like cold wars where it just got tense. Like he's like wanting to go out with a friend and you don't say anything and he just goes and then you're resentful about it. Kind of, is that how it was going? Yeah. Or was there a fight about it or? No. Um, and then, like I said, this was the very beginning. Um, but like it, it got to the point where I did finally just I was going to like explode, but yeah, I was like, it would be like a cold war where I would just feel distant. I would distance myself from him. I would be a little colder. He would wonder, you know, what's going on and he'd poke in and that would usually bug me. (laughs) And then, but one day I, I, I didn't know I was so stuck in my head and I didn't know what else to do about it. And I just thought this is his fault. Um, I'm not. And I told him, I said, I just don't know if I love you. And I feel like maybe I made a mistake. And, um, he was like, Whoa, like it took him back, you know, and we talked about it. And again, just the patient caring guy he is just was like, well, let's talk about it. (laughs) And I'm not good at talking. I have everything inside and I, it was really hard for me, but I, you know, we stuck it through, we talked it out and we kind of both were like, well, you know, what do we do? And neither of us want to get divorced. So, um, and he was sure that he loved me. So there was no problem there, but, um, 
-hmm. we both just decided in that moment, that was the very beginning of our marriage. Um, well, we'll just treat it like an arranged marriage. We arranged it ourselves, but this is where we are now. And, you know, we're not sure, but we're just going to move forward. And that's kind of how it all started. And we, we did, we worked through things and we, we kept going, but those moments where I would just spiral and go to that dark place and do the cold war thing and distance myself, it would come up from time to time. It just kept coming up and then I'd get over it and then it would come up again. Um, and I just really felt like we were lacking kind of the deep connection and understanding that I wanted. I didn't feel understood a lot of the time. And so part of you, that when you were talking about the anxiety coming up, you were thinking like, this isn't the right guy. I should have married someone else. I should have waited until I met the right guy. Is that? Yeah, definitely. Those, it was so many thoughts, Laura. Those were a couple of them that definitely came up that I just had, I'd been too hasty. I'd not thought it through. I hadn't listened to the warnings that would come because I had those moments of concern before we got married, but then I would kind of get over them. Um, But that would all come crashing in on me as soon as he said or did something that triggered it or even outside sources. Like if somebody said, like, again, we went to Disney world on our honeymoon. And again, this is in the very beginning, but somebody says he had a little just married pin on my bag that he was carrying for me. And somebody says, you just married, you're like 12. And it was like, just a trigger for me. Like, Oh, I married this child. You know, I, how he, embarrassing. Yeah. Like, yeah. People, and it was funny that like, we laughed about it, but again, it just like poked at that little bit of insecurity that like, Oh, what did I do? Yeah. Yeah. So it does sound, um, it sounds terrifying. It sounds heavy and burdensome to be thinking about this. And I, um, I'm kind of loving the part where you said, uh, you said something like, I, I don't like to communicate. Is that how you said it? Cause I think mm-hmm. so often around here, we hear about like the woman, the wife sitting the husband down and explaining, you know, and having that state of the union address. And you're saying that wasn't you at all. You were trying to avoid uh, giving a voice to these awful thoughts that you were carrying around by yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I couldn't. I, and I, I guess deep down, I knew that like telling him certain things or blaming him wouldn't really help, but I just kept it all inside and then it would eat me and I would blame him. And then I would feel shame again for making the wrong choice or not being smart about it. And it just ate me up inside. And you telling him, um, I I don't know if I love you, that must've had some repercussions too, right? Even though you recovered from it, that that had to be pretty hurtful for him to hear. And I could see it causing him to maybe distant, be distant a little bit. Is that? Yeah, yeah. definitely um, affected our marriage in future times and made him a little skittish about things sometimes. Um, I couldn't understand that either at first because I was like, wait, like I told you that I loved you. And, and I just, I don't know. It was like, I would try to, I didn't quite understand. Now I, now I understand how how much that affected our relationship. Um, but I didn't at the time he was, he was so my husband is just this fun, loving, easygoing guy. And I just thought like he can get, like he got over it fast. Wow, Nice. Yeah. Well, he does sound like a great guy. I guess, I guess I'm jumping ahead, but it sounds like you married a great guy. <laughs> to me. So, um, so it's not, so uh, there wasn't a lot of fighting at your house then. Is that right? It was more just like this recurring tension that you kept inside of you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and he would know about it cause he's tuned into you or he would ask what's wrong. And then that was when it would kind of, so then it was cyclical. It sounds like it would come visit and then it would go away and then it would come visit again. Yeah. There was always something that would kind of, you know, I would have time to think, or he, you know, we would kind of talk about it and he'd say something that I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Or I'd hear something that kind of was like, okay, like it's fine, you know, but then again, it'd be fine for a little while. And then something would trigger it again. And I'd go down that, that spiraling path. And it, it was, it was painful and it kept on happening. Yeah. It does sound very painful. So, um, was there a moment when you thought, okay, we, we can't go on like this. Um, I really think it was like kind of in the beginning, the story that I told just about like, Hey, we're just going to pretend like this is an arranged marriage. That was kind of the real first moment when I was like, we can't go on like this. Um, but then there were moments like, 
after we had our first baby or our second baby, I was so overwhelmed and I just couldn't like do the bills anymore. I was responsible for all the bills and all that stuff. And and our money. And I told him like, I just can't do this anymore. And so we worked something out where we had like a budget and it was great. And then, um, but then I would try to stick really hard to the budget and would like deny myself of things. And he would go make a purchase that was outside of our budget. And, um, that would upset me. And again, I, every once in a while, I would say something about it, you know, but like, there, I didn't get any traction with that. And so it was just like, well, you know, here I am, I guess I just suck it up and keep going. Um, just reminding me there were, there was some more to the battle days from the beginning to the, to where I am now. Um, like he just had so much fun at work. It seemed like, and I was at home with little kids and isolated and had, didn't have a lot of friends. And he was like playing ping pong and video games and like calling me to tell me where he was going out to lunch that day. And I'm at home thinking like, we have this budget and I can't go out whenever I want. And I have little kids. And, um, so he would come home and I'd be happy to see him at first, but then he'd say something and like the resentment would just hit or the jealousy over his friends would hit. Um, so that was also part of, those were some of the things that would trigger just that, that resentment that would come up and then just kind of start eating me up. I, I think this is, I mean, I'm, I bet a lot of listeners can relate so big to having those kids at home, you know, be, being a stay at home mom and like his life looks so glamorous. You're like, he's having fun. He's having mm-hmm. a great time. Uh, and he's spending whatever he wants. And um, just even to get in the car to go somewhere with two little kids, right. It's kind of impossible sometimes, right. Or that's, that's going to take most of your morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, anyway, so, and then by the time he comes home, instead of, uh, you know, it sounds like you, you were happy to see him, but at the same time, there was this jealousy and resentment that was kind of simmering underneath all the time. And I think yes. that's such a common, um, theme. Uh, so, so what happened, what happened with your marriage then? Um, well, again, it just kept on going like that. Good days, good days. And then a bad day, you know, and then, um, and then in 2016, about I came across, I was in this group and I came across somebody talking about your book and the, the person that they were responding to in this comment thread was like in a really dire situation. And these two women both got on and said, this is the only thing that helped me this book. And so I was like, huh. It's like, I, like things are pretty good. Like I like where I'm at, but I, I know that there's some things that I would really love to change about our relationship. And so I got the book, I started reading the book and almost immediately, I just had all this validation for, um, for who I had chosen to marry that never really stuck before. Like I'd heard things here and there that again, would take me out of that, um, that negative spiral that I was in. Um, but that was the first thing that really like switched or had made an effect. And so I was reading this book and my husband comes home just like normal and he says something and I immediately go to that place where I'm annoyed at what he's saying or like, he doesn't get it. Um, and, but I stopped before I said or did anything. And I, I didn't even realize this until recently, but I, I realized he was playing with our kids he was playing, he had one of them on his shoulders and he's playing with our kids. And I just, I saw what I was doing and the road I was going down. And then I saw him playing with those kids and thought, Oh, I have a good man. He's playing with our kids. And it just like, I didn't even have to think about it. It just went away. The feeling of like annoyance that I was totally going to go and could have resulted in like the cold shoulder. Um, it just went away. And, and I, this was all new to me. And so you know, I'm kind of laughing at the whole situation in my head. And then I smile and, um, he looked at me like what, what just happened? Cause he knew what, where it was going, where it was headed and, um, it wasn't going to say anything or anything, but, um, I just smiled at him and I came close to him and I gave him a hug and, um, and we just kind of laughed instead of this, cold war or this resentment that would have normally taken place. And that was like the first big clue that like, wow, there's, there's something to this. And, and I have been, I have been sitting on this fence where I, sometimes I'm on one side and sometimes I'm on the other and it's not where I want to be. I want to be firmly on one side. Um, 
And so that was really the first thing that kind of changed, like had a major effect. That's a big thing because it sounds like you changed your focus in that moment. It was like the first time and you were aware that that's what you were doing. You could go down that old dirt road and making a list of all the reasons he's not the right guy, like whatever mm-hmm. it was he said, but you instead focused on how he was, he's a great dad. He was playing with yeah. your kids uh, and it felt good and brought you closer together. And that's what you want more of. So this was yeah. a, an epiphany moment. Definitely. And he said, he said something to you about it. I think, right. He's it, yeah. He was just like, what just happened? Like what, what switched? He could like see the change, you know, just kind of happen. He's used to me doing one thing and he's, he's like really nonchalant about it. Like he's so used to it, like whatever here, you know, I don't even know if he even thought about it. Cause it was just the norm, Yeah. but he could definitely sense that something had changed and he was, he was happy about it too. Yeah. So he knows the old dance really well, but like, yeah. he's been doing it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And ha- had you guys ever like gone to marriage counseling or done anything else to try to fix the problems or. No, really. I'm really into self-help. I, you know, I'm always trying to find what I can do on my own. And so no, and it never got to a point or at least, and I was too, I didn't want, I didn't even want to talk to anybody about it. I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about it. I just wanted to fix it on my own, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's big, right? It's not having to say anything. What were you thinking? Like if you had to talk to somebody about it, what what's so distasteful about that? Um, well, so I have had one experience where I went and talked to a counselor and it was like the first appointment was all intake type stuff. And I felt this particular scenario had nothing to do with my marriage, but, um, I just kind of felt like, like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through all this stuff. I don't want to tell this person all these things. And the counselor seemed really, I mean, I'm sure they're used to it. They see it all the time, but it just felt so nonchalant and um, I just felt like, man, I'm in a crisis here. And this guy is like asking me these intake questions, you know, and I just, it just wasn't my, yeah, my style, I guess. Didn't feel emotionally safe to reveal all that. It sounds like. No. And I didn't want to go through the effort of like finding the right one either. Just yeah. seemed like too much work and I could figure it out on my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then that is exactly what you did. Yeah. With, with a lot of help eventually. So, all right. So what, what else did you do besides changing your focus from um, your fear to really finding your faith in your husband? What other kinds of uh, changes did you make in your marriage? Um, that was the biggest one. I think at first was just changing that focus. Um, I just, again, I had these thoughts in my head, like, he's immature. He doesn't know how to do things. I know how to do all these things. Cause I have all this life experience that he doesn't have. And those, that was what ruled when we'd have conversations. So we'd have, um, we'd have a conversation about something and I would, he would say something and I would be like, oh, he just doesn't get it. Like what is going on? And so I started to think the opposite. I started to think, no, he understands me. Like, maybe I don't see it, but he understands me and he loves me. And so I started just like listening more and looking for evidence of that. And the more still and quiet I was, the more I could see it. Um, And again, it was like, I just had those immediate internal reactions to things he would say. And so my mind would go off on that path instead of the other path that I started to kind of go down instead, like, no, my husband loves me. I have a good man. I'm just going to hear this out. And I would start to hear it. I would start hearing the things that I wanted to hear that I thought he wasn't saying, or that I didn't feel or that he didn't get me like, yeah, that was a big deal. Wait. So did he change? Did he start saying those things and he hadn't been before, or are you saying something else? Well, for me, I think he was always saying them. I just didn't hear them. I heard what I was thinking. I heard my biases and my insecurities coming out. So I, that was always like the filter that I was listening to him through was that he didn't understand me or that he didn't, whatever it was. And so that's what I was hearing when he would say things to me. But then if I, once I started to really like 
focus on that, on that I had a good man and like, I loved him and he loves me and he cares about me. I started to see it more in the things that he was saying that I didn't, couldn't see it before. Wow. Incredible. So it sounds like you got a new pair of perspectacles and then he really lived up to everything uh, that you were repeating to yourself, this mantra that you had, I married a good guy and he loves me. Yeah. Everything, everything that I thought was true turns out to not be true that I really just wasn't here, like really hearing him. I wasn't, I was hearing myself. I was hearing that internal argument that I always had with myself. And I'm really good at arguing with myself inside. It's like one half of my brain presents an argument and the other half presents the other argument and it just goes back and forth. Yeah. Okay. I love that. So um, how did you become a better listener? Like, how did you do that? Um, I just had to stop interjecting or defending myself. I felt like I had to explain myself a lot. Like, oh, he's not getting it. I got to explain why this is hard for me or, um, or just again, getting that flustered feeling inside. I had to stop and I had to start like thinking like, okay, look, this is what I'm doing. I see it happening again. I see that I'm getting upset. So what is it that, what is it that I'm, you know, looking for? What am I focused on and what would I rather be experiencing? And so, and I don't know, it wasn't that, you know, thought out, but that's basically what it was. I just, I just started looking for that and started listening and stopped being so defensive how do you think you got yourself to be less defensive though? Cause that's kind of hard to do. Like this happens in a nanosecond, right? This whole, right. Uh, you're kind of, you're breaking it down for us, which I love uh, all these little questions you would ask to yourself, but how did you get there? Um, well, I learned the six intimacy skills. <laughs> I learned the six intimacy skills and I learned that, um, that again, that that pattern that was happening just wasn't serving me. And I started to recognize it and I started to kind of acknowledge that it was happening. And, um, and I had, I had hope that, that if I started doing something different, I would have a different result. And that, that was my experience was that when I did not all the time, cause it's still, and even still, I I, I confuse some things still. And I, and I'm like, oops, that's, that didn't create more connection. Like, what did I miss there? You know, but, um, just noticing it and just seeing it. I, I see it all the time. Now I see the direction I would have gone in the battle days. And then I just stop. I just stop myself. I sit there and I think about, okay, what am I going to do differently now? How am I going to change? It's kind of like a superpower. It sounds like. Yeah, it really is. It really <laughs> changed. It's changed everything. Absolutely everything. Fantastic. Well done. So what else? What else is different um, about Brenda than um, it was before? Well, I learned how to communicate. I learned really? how to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> I learned how to communicate in a way that served me and serves my marriage and the connection that I want. Um, and that was like I've, I've learned to identify my feelings. I, Laura, I feel kind of like a crazy person, but I could not have told you what I was feeling when I was in those dark places. I didn't know it was a mix. Now I can say it was a mixture of anger and frustration and sadness and loneliness. And, but at the time I didn't know what it was. I just knew I felt terrible, but now I can like identify like how I'm feeling. And then, um, from there, I can ask, okay, well, what is it that I would really want right now? And then I'm able to say it out loud or write it down or whatever it is. I just have this outlet that I didn't have before. Um, and I can tell my husband things that I'm feeling and things that I would love. And, um, and I'm working on <laughs> still working on overcoming my expectations that are behind that sometimes. Sure. Um, but just that, just that alone, learning that, um, and how to, how to just stay with myself and stay present with myself instead of going outside of myself, looking for validation for other, from other people, from my husband, um, all changed with the, with the skills 
Wow. I love that. How does your husband respond uh, to these desires that you say out loud? He is quick to fulfill them a lot of the times. And even if he doesn't, I do them myself at some point when I feel like it again, I'm so present now to my feelings and what feels good to me that like, you know, like today I do want to put up my curtain rod. And so I do, and I feel great and it's fine. Um, and like my husband goes to parent teacher conferences and he goes, takes the kids to the fall festival and things like that, that are not my favorite thing to do. And before I would have just done them and, you know, thought like, Oh, like here it goes again. I'm, I'm doing all these things by myself. I don't have any support. But now I just say like, oh, I'd love, I'd love help with parent teacher conferences, or I just can't do them because they stress me out. Or like one of the, one of my favorite things is I always wanted to have like a really specific kind of nighttime routine with our kids and it was never happening. And to me, I'm like, well, the husband's my lead, the leader in the home. He should be taking charge of this. And he wasn't. So again, I have this this evidence of my old way of thinking and it would just not do good. I wasn't being respectful to him and to, to his way of doing things. Um, so one day I, I said exactly how I wanted it to go. Like, oh, I would love if we, if we got everybody together and we did X, Y, Z before bed. And then I let it go. And that night he gathered up the kids and we did the things all the things that were on my list and oh my we do them all the time now. And when I'm not here, he does them. And, um, that was such a huge thing for me. I was like, Oh my gosh, like that's all I had to do. I've been it stuck in this resentment all these years. And all I had to do was say, man, I would just, I would love it to be like this at night. And, and he hopped up to do it. And now he does it all the time. And it's so, so nice. And I love it so much. And it's like that with a lot of things, a lot of other little things, especially with parenting. I've let so much go. I have so much less, um, responsibility now. I mean, I still have the same, the same responsibilities, but like they're shared now. I'm not the only one doing them. And if I feel like I am the only one doing them and I'm maybe getting a little resentful, I just stop and I find something to do that gets my mind off of it. And I don't try to do it. I don't try to do everything anymore. I let my husband and then, and then it just has this great effect where I see him doing that. And I just fall in love with him. And I'm just so grateful for the husband that I have. It's win, 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 win. And just kind of like a virtuous cycle. <laughs> so yes. Like, yeah, yes, it really is. So I love that. So it sounds like you don't go to parent teacher conferences anymore. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't go to quite a few and now we kind of split it just depending on, you know, our schedules, but yeah. Yeah. My husband goes to parent teacher conferences and talks with teachers and helps our kids with lots of things. My husband runs a carpool in the morning, which wow. is another thing. I used to take my kids to school in the morning and I didn't get it because my husband had a really flexible work schedule and, and I had little babies and I had kids in school and, you know, I would think like, doesn't he see that? Like I could use help with this. I didn't get how he couldn't see it. Um, but you know, then I, I, I would love help. <laughs> I would love help taking the kids to school and now he does it and he takes them in the mornings and I don't have to do that part. And I'm with them in the afternoons all afternoon. And, um, it's just this great balance now, whereas before it just felt like totally out of balance. Wow. I love that. So, um, and does he seem resentful about running carpool in the morning or any of these other things that you're not as far as I can tell. Again, he's just so, he's just so easygoing and happy to do it. And I, I love seeing him do it because things that would stress him or stress me out don't seem to stress him out. So yeah. it's so nice to just, to just not be stressed out about, about doing everything all the time. And, and like, it's that virtuous cycle again, where I'm like, oh. and then I remember, I have to remember, I have to remember to be grateful for those things and to take note of them. Cause it's easy to kind of take it for granted. And I think I did probably some of that in the battle days, just took those things for granted or, or thought or expected them. Like, this is, this is the, these are the principles that we both agreed on and we operate under. And when they didn't happen again, I had my evidence. Um, but now I don't, it's not, it's not, I have to catch myself just to make sure that I don't have 
that running that I always make sure that like, no, these are, I have to focus on these things. These are amazing things that I don't want to take for granted. And what do you, and what do you do with that? What do you, do you say something to him or? What do you yeah, do? for sure. I definitely make a point to tell him I'm grateful for certain things. And I, it's funny. Cause when I think back on our marriage, I think I was practicing some of the skills, some of the time I just yeah. didn't have no concept yeah. of them. So I didn't know, you know, so I think that carried through the times that I was like, that I came to those moments, carried us through, you know, our whole marriage. Um, but now I'm just more conscious of them. And I do make an effort to write down the things that I'm grateful for about him. And so I have a little list that I can kind of go back to, um, when I'm frustrated, (laughs) um, which still happens sometimes, but it's so easy to get out of it. And I don't, again, I just don't go down that painful path anymore where I was not sure about all my choices in life. Yeah. It's not tempting anymore. It sounds like, no, it's it really is an appeal. <laughs> like whatever it was before that's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, and how would you describe your marriage now? What's it like? Oh, it's, it's great. It's so much more peaceful. It's so for me, even like, I, I apologize to my husband for some things that I had done in the past and ways that I thought And again, he's just this great guy. So (laughs) he's like, I just feel bad for you that you were experiencing that. (laughs) Like part of me wants to be like, wait, what? Like, I want you to feel some of this too. I want you to understand this pain that I was in. And that's where it would come in. Like where I'd want to argue with him or I'd want to prove how bad it was so that he, you know, would understand. But I just, I just accept it now. I accept his, his love and his support. And I don't try to like deflect it. I think I did a lot of that too. He would try to comfort me. And I was kind of like, no, I need, you know, like I need more than that. I want more than that. And, and I just wasn't accepting all that he was offering. He was offering me so much. And I just was deflecting it because I believed the other way or, or I was in that space when he was talking to me about, about things. Like what could he have done besides trying to comfort you? What else were you looking for in those moments? Um, I guess I was just, <laughs> I was looking for like, like a therapist, I guess somebody who would, or like the coach, like the coaches that I work with now, you know, it's just that empathy and, and understanding and um, like true understanding of what it was like. Cause I just didn't feel like he really understood what it was like. Yeah. Yeah. But now I don't, I don't feel like I, I have to have that from him. I, I get it other places and I get to just enjoy the love and the, like his attempts to comfort me now. I'm like, Oh, this is so nice. I just melt into them now. And I, and I just think of how, how wonderful he is instead of like, oh, he just doesn't get it, which was what I would think before. Wow. Uh... That sounds like you are a much better receiver than you used to be. Is that yes, right? for sure. That's definitely true. With him comforting you, but also with other things too? Yeah. Um, I try to receive, I try to, I always think of it like this too. It's like, when we talk about it a lot, we'll talk about respect. But for me, it's like, I'm receiving his words because I just deflected them so often with my with my disrespect, but I didn't realize that that's what it was. I just thought I felt justified, you know? And so now I, like, I try to receive his words and take them for what he, what he says, instead of questioning, like, does he really, does he really feel that way? Does he really know what he's saying? Does he really understand? Um, so I receive his words. And that's another thing that I do kind of now when I step back and I see myself going in one direction, I step back and I try to just take in his words and take them for face value. When he says he loves about, he loves me or he cares about me. I just take it for face value now and I don't question it. Um, and yeah, I, I do a lot of receiving from other people too. Now I've, ex- I accept help when it's offered and I'm grateful for it and it does, it feels uncomfortable sometimes, but, um, at the end of the day, it feels good. So even if I'm uncomfortable receiving something, it feels good. And, like I said, I, ex, you know, I, I express desires for things. Um, and when my husband's willing, or he says like, go ahead, I do it now. I used to like, not do it when he would say like, go ahead. I thought I, I wanted him to do it for me. I wanted him to give me the gift or give me the thing. 
Um, but now I just think, no, like he's giving me that gift. I just, cause I have to go pick it up for myself or order it online. Doesn't mean he's not giving me this gift that I want. And, and even things he does, he gets me things too, that I hadn't even, you know, asked for or expected. And I'm just grateful now for those things. I just see it like, uh, this guy just loves me <laughs> and I'm so grateful. Oh. I just have such an amazing husband and I always have. And, um, I'm just grateful that I get to see it all the time now that it's not, that it's not sporadic. It's not off and on. It's just way more constant. And it just brings a peace to our marriage and to our home and our family that, and to me, I mean, so much to me that it just wasn't always present. Hmm. So this arranged marriage kind of is working out. Yeah, it's worked out. <laughs> it does. Arranged marriages can work out. They can, you can work things out. You can be happy. You can have a successful marriage, even if it's, even if it's arranged, even if you got married after a week of knowing someone. <laughs> even if you arranged it yourself or, yep. or it was arranged for you. So, so um, what's your tip for someone though, who, who is struggling with uh, how you were thinking, like, is this the right guy? Maybe I, I should have waited. I was too hasty. There's so many um, things where, uh, I mean, I kind of hear a theme of you feeling like he was immature, not mm -hmm. responsible enough. Um, so mm -hmm. what's your advice? She wants what you have now where he's going to the parent teacher conferences and running the bedtime routine in the carpool in the morning and um, where she feels um, treated and she gets to receive his comfort and all these other things that he does for you. What's your best tip for her? How should she, how should she get to where you are? Um, first I would tell her to read one of your books, um, read the empowered wife. I, again, you have a few books and I read a different one and, um, I can't remember exactly how each one of them starts, but, um, for me, it was just starting with that belief that I had a good man. And again, I believed it, but it was like, when something would trigger the negative, I would go back to that and question. So, um, just reading the books, getting that foundation. And then, um, gosh, I thought I was doing pretty, pretty well with the skills and, um, you know, I thought I kind of understood them enough and they were helping, but I hit some pretty big roadblocks where I went down that spiral again. And that propelled me to do your five day adored wife challenge, which reinforced everything for me. Like this is, I need to do these things. I need to understand them better. Um, and then I ended up now I, I receive coaching regularly, which helps me to really, really get to the bottom of of why does that keep happening? And, and, um, and just to smooth out all the, all the little things that still come up from time to time. And just again, to get that validation and that support and, and like a new perspective, something to help me shift my focus. Cause I can't always see it, or, um, I don't always want to do the thing that I think is the right thing to do in the moment. Yeah. Well, it is tremendous how far you've come, Brenda, as far as, um, it just sounds like you get to decide, uh, what your marriage is going to look like, right. Yeah. From, from day to day. And so I, I, uh, yeah, I just love how all the progress that you've made. So, um, so that's Thank great. You. Um, and wh what do you think you'd say to, to Brenda, if you could go back in time and tell her what you know now? Oh, I would tell her that it's going to be okay. Um, that, that all of this, that like, especially in those really painful moments where I was questioning things, like, you're not going to feel like this forever. Um, there is a way out. You're going to find it and you're going to do it and it's going to help. And you're just going to keep pursuing it until you get to where you want to be. Um, and yeah, just just go after those things that, that feel right. That feel like, and maybe even don't feel right at, right at first, but you feel some resistance to them. Um, that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign that, that maybe it's the right thing. And what do you have to lose by trying it? Well, yeah, that's a, you bring up a good point, right? It is not that comfortable in the beginning to use the intimacy skills. Did you feel, um, I don't know. I mean, cause you were already feeling resentful. Did you feel resentful that you had to do all this work? And you're, I mean, that was a big part of the problem, right? Your husband 
wasn't yeah. doing stuff and you were doing everything. So what, how did you get past that? Um, I didn't really, it was like so enjoyable for me just to like have the realizations and the aha moments that I, I just loved that so much, but I did find that just reading the book and kind of having this rough idea of what the skills were that I didn't always implement them all correctly or in the right situations. And like one of the big triggers that, you know, forced me back into them and to like really do more of a deep dive was we were buying a house and I had this, I had this really strong impression. I want to get out of debt. I want to downsize. Um, and so we bought it, we signed a contract on a new house. We were going through all of it. Um, it came to the point where we had to pay the construction deposit. And my husband said, I don't want to pay it unless our house is sold and our house wasn't sold yet. And so I'm trying to practice the skills. Um, but this, we ended up not buying the house and I was devastated. And I, again, just went to that place of blame and I, was so upset about it. And I, I was like, yeah, these aren't working. I've done all the skills that I know. Um, and I hit that point, but then I, you know, I kind of came back inside myself and I thought, you know, maybe I'm just not getting it right. And so I went back to them and I realized now when I look back, I'm like, nope, I, I didn't have my self-care in place. I didn't have, I, you know, I was focused on one skill, trying to work this one skill and it wasn't, um, I needed a couple more skills. I needed support and I needed to focus on even just some of the basics. Like that's one of the things that I've learned is just how to, how to make myself happy, how to refocus by doing things that I enjoy and being filled up. Like my husband says he wants to go out golfing, which used to be like a point of like resentment. It doesn't happen because I went out with my friends the night before, or I had done something that made me happy the day before. So when that comes up, I'm like, yeah, great. Go have fun. Um, whereas before it's like, I didn't have anything. I had nothing. I had very little. And the times that I look back on my marriage that were good, I realized like, oh, I was taking an art class, even though that was really hard moment in my marriage or in our family, like seems like it would have been a difficult, it, you know, like when my husband was starting startups and stuff, um, I was, I had made taking an art class a priority for myself and I didn't know that I was practicing the skill of self-care, but, um, it's what got, like, I didn't even realize that we were, that it was hard because I had been doing those things. So that's another, another thing that's totally different now. That is a great example of, um, yeah, you're practicing the skills without even really realizing it. And uh, I can appreciate this moment too, with the house feeling like you lost the house and it's like, well. I mean, I think it's just natural for any mere mortal woman to think like, well, the skills aren't really working for me or for my yeah. husband, they don't work. Um, so I love it. It looks like in hindsight, you can see like, oh, okay. I was just focusing on one skill. Which skill were you focusing on using that? Um, I, I was focused on like expressing my desires, but I definitely had expectations behind them. So it wasn't, I wasn't practicing that fully. Um it wasn't a pure desire. Yeah. No, it wasn't a pure desire. And, and I kind of just thought like, oh, I just say this and like, it'll happen. You know, yeah. kind of, that was kind of my initial understanding of that skill, which I'm like, okay, doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, I wasn't there. Were, yeah. I just wasn't practicing the other ones. I was just focused on that one. Yeah. Or that, yeah. that aspect of, of vulnerability. Yeah. So there might've been a different outcome with more skills at work. It sounds like. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually we've gone through similar, similar situations now. I mean, we're actually like kind of in a similar situation now. And it's like, not, I, I didn't go to that place. Like he did when he told me that, like, we're just not going to do it. We're not going to move forward on it. Like, man, those negative thoughts hit fast. Um, now he says something like that. And I say, okay, you know, whatever you think, I trust you. And I really love to do this or to buy this house. Um, but then I find something to focus on that makes me happy that gets my mind off of it. Or, you know, I just don't so nice. I just don't go. I don't go there anymore. 
go down don't go down the dark alley like yeah, you would have. yeah. <laughs> the dark alley the theme and what of- a great what a great example of using uh expressing desires with an and instead of a but right okay mm-hmm. whatever you think and <clears throat> and i would really love to buy this house it does sound like good uh good skills yeah so you sound very skillful oh thank you <laughs> how how, uh, how has it impacted your children that you've done all this work on your relationship and yourself Um, my kids have co-parents. Um, I'm not the only responsible one anymore. In fact, my husband teaches my kids responsibility now. Um, and I do have to catch myself because he'll, it's so funny how my brain just, again, it just wants to argue with somebody. Um, (laughs) but he'll, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll express a desire like, Oh, I would love a clean kitchen, you know? And and he'll say, Hey kids, go clean the kitchen. And he'll get all the kids cleaning the kitchen. And I'll think, well, I wanted him to do it because then I would know that he loves me. You know, like, um, I had these expectations before, but now again, I catch myself. I'm like, Oh, that's funny that I used to, that I used to do that. And, um, my husband is teaching my kids responsibility, which yeah. is something that I would love for them to know. And, um, it's funny how I would, my natural reaction is to want to like, be like, Oh, well, like, aren't you going to help them? Or like, I wanted you to, I would never say it out loud, but again, I would think it in my head (laughs) and kind of just go down that, that path. Um, but yeah, now, now he is, you know, and so maybe they don't like it all the time because they have to do a lot more, but my husband is so generous with them and always is rewarding them for the things that they do. Where am I? I'm like, no, you just have to do it because you're a part of our family. But, um, they're learning just different things. They're learning different ways of being different, different styles of parenting. And, and I love it. And I appreciate it. Now I realize that that will be an asset to them in the future. Um, and again, we have that, we have that bedtime routine. We both help with it. Um, so they have that, I just feel like they have that solid foundation of two parents who love each other and, um, and they know, and they might never know what it's like to not have that because they've kind of had it and, but I know what it was like to not have it. And so, um, I'm just grateful that, that they have that, that they have that for themselves. You, you say, you know what that was like from your childhood, you're saying, yeah. So it wasn't modeled with this home court advantage that you have for your kids. That wasn't modeled for you. No, no. I uh, grew up with a divorce separated mom and, um, yeah, I just didn't have that, had a, had a very different life than my kids have. Yeah. And I think it caused a lot of some of the things that I, you know, work through now. Um, and that my husband gave me kind of a, a foil to, to work it through, but I'm, I'm so grateful that I have this loving relationship that I could do that and really come out on top. Um, Yeah. Oh, you must feel so proud mm-hmm. and being able to model that for your children, um, is also, there's no greater gift too to give them than, than this, uh, loving parents, parents who love each other. And, uh, I really hear you saying that this, your marriage has been a crucible for your own healing or like a, a laboratory for yes. you to heal personally. Yes, uh, definitely. You said that really well. It for sure has been. Yeah. It's really beautiful because, um, that was true for me too. And, um, I don't know how else I would have done it without that, uh, without being in a relationship, having, it's almost like standing in front of a mirror and being able to really see yourself Yeah, uh, because of the reactions that you get back. So, um, anyway, this, I'm super inspired and moved by, um, everything you're sharing about what you've accomplished and what's possible and, and how you did it and uh, what it feels like now. And especially I'd love your authenticity and saying like, he tries to get the kids to do it and your head goes, no, but I wanted you to do it to, to make sure that you love me. Uh, Cause I can relate. I think that's just a, <laughs> such a common experience. Right. So very relatable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing all these intimate details. I really kind of get you're not the kind of person you didn't like intake calls with therapists. So um, mm-hmm. really for you to come on the podcast and share all this with us is a, a pretty big deal. So I am so grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. You did a great job. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Laura.
If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. Relationship advice. Uh, the worst relationship advice. Uh, yeah, it's the worst relationship advice. Uh, the worst relationship advice. Uh, for me. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. And the advice that I'm brooding about this week was sent to me by a longtime student who found this pathetic tripe in a well-known online publication. So here's your anonymous shout out for sending me this bunk. You nailed it. Thanks for the love. And thanks for helping me create the podcast. I just love that. The article headline says, my husband won't go to bed at the same time as me, and it's ruining our marriage. And then the subhead says, you have been doing a great job at communicating your feelings directly and using I statements. And you've tried couples counseling too. Okay, so that's pretty much all we can do on your end to facilitate change on his end. However, I think your husband may have his own issues going on here that are making this so difficult. Isn't this so bad? It's good. I mean, I love it. Okay. In other words, the answer is that she should change her husband who is to blame for all her problems, which of course, you know, you can't do, you can't change your husband, but she could waste a lot of energy focusing on how he's wrong and bad. And he's making things so difficult and how hopeless it all is because he won't change instead of being empowered to change what she can. It's just like, in the serenity prayer, right? It talks about having the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference between me and someone else like my husband. But this article's suggestion is more like, you know, have the arrogance to try to change your husband and the delusion to think that he's the one that needs to change to begin with. Of course, the wife who wrote this may feel like she did try to do what she could, by using those blasted I statements. Like, I feel like you're attacking me, right? It's kind of how they usually come out. I know, I'm sure that's not how you're supposed to use I statements, but anyway. And then going to couples counseling, which none of that ever worked for me. And none of that, I mean, so many students I talk to say the same thing. It didn't work for them either. You know, I, I have to admit, I couldn't read any more of this article without getting nauseated and disgusted. So I have no idea where it went from there. But the headline reminded me of one of the coach's stories who had the same complaint when she first arrived on her camp on this campus. She said her husband never wanted to go to bed at the same time as her. And he never wanted to go on road trips with the family. And he, he didn't even want to eat with the family. He was avoiding her. And this is one of the things that I love about Laura Doyle certified coaches is that they have had these challenges themselves. It's not just hypothetical. They've struggled and been lonely in their marriages too, like this coach I'm talking about. And this coach had also tried communicating with him what she needed and felt that it was really his problem that was making things so difficult, just like the advice from this, yeah, from this publication. So She was critical and complaining a lot, which made him even more distant, as you can imagine. But then she made some changes, including expressing her gratitude for him every day. She started giving him gratitude at bedtime every night. And she reported that not only did he start coming to bed with her at the same time, he was eager to go to bed with her because he didn't want to miss hearing about what she appreciated about him so much. So she became an irresistible magnet again by finding the courage to change something within her power 
focusing on what she was grateful for instead of finding fault with him like it was buried treasure. He also started taking the family on vacations and road trips and, and also began eating with them again too. But blaming her husband for being inattentive and distant never got her there. Focusing on his problems was just a distraction from some changes she needed to make for her own happiness, including cultivating a grateful heart. Instead of focusing on what her husband was doing wrong, she started focusing on what he was doing right. And she got more of that. And that's what we see again and again and again. And for those reasons, the advice that when your husband won't come to bed at the same time of you, it's because, quote, your husband may have his own issues going on here that are making this so difficult is the very, very, very worst relationship advice I have heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'm talking about five ways to fix a sexless marriage. And in the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that the Empowered Wife podcast has been downloaded over 2 million times, which means you must be sharing it with your friends and family and supporting me and the mission to end world divorce, which makes me feel so loved and supported. So thank you for spreading the word. I'm so grateful to you.